Meet Carl. Carl was born in 1870 in Indianapolis. When he was 17 years old, he landed a job as a salesman at a hardware store. This hardware store, the Vonnegut Hardware Company, located on Washington Street in downtown Indianapolis. By the time he was 27, Carl had become the sales manager for the builder's hardware department. The time that we become particularly interested in is December of his 33rd year, 1903. Carl had been in Chicago on business during the last week of December, and on Wednesday, the day before New Year's Eve, was trying to get a train ticket back to Indianapolis. Unfortunately, there weren't any train tickets available. Being stuck in Chicago for another day, he decided to make the most of it and try to see a show. The show he would try to see was a new play, in one of the newest and most talked about theaters on earth. This theater, the Iroquois Theater. To Chicago, the theater was more than just a venue. It was a plan to unseat New York City as the center of the theater universe. The architecture was dramatic, and the beauty and opulence of the interior was widely praised. It had global attention. Particularly unusual and dazzling was the entrance hall, where all patrons passed through to go from the lobby to their seats. Many staircases in different directions took people from the first floor to the second floor and up to the third floor at the top of this drawing, in an open decorative room that allowed theater goers to, quote, see and be seen, regardless of how much they paid for their ticket, unquote. And at this time in Chicago, this was the place to be seen. The theater was built very quickly, with most of the construction taking place over the summer of 1903. There was an urgency to begin making money from the investment, and the plan was to open the theater at the end of the summer, and when that didn't happen, to open by October. There must have been a warning about opening by Thanksgiving, because the premiere performance took place on November 23rd. The play that would open the theater was a musical called Mr. Bluebeard. Criticized for minimal plot and storyline, it was highly praised for its dazzling visuals, extravagant costumes, and numerous set pieces. It probably didn't matter what play was playing, as long as it was a memorable experience and an opportunity to say that you saw one of the shows in the new Iroquois Theater. Saying you were going to see a show at the Iroquois in 1903 may have been like saying you were going to the hottest show on Broadway. On the matter of safety, architect Benjamin Marshall said that he, quote, studied every theater disaster in history, unquote, and accounted for them in his designs. Even on this playbill, a claim to its safety, absolutely fireproof, is in the upper right corner. Mr. Bluebeard was so popular in the first month that the theater added matinee shows two days a week mostly to attract women and children out shopping during the day. The Wednesday afternoon show on December 30th started at 2 p.m. and continued through the first intermission without issue. The show was beyond sold out, and the theater enacted what was called standing room only, meaning you could see the show if you were willing to stand, typically behind the last row of seats. On this day, standing room only was four rows deep. In a theater with a capacity of 1,200, 1,800 were inside. During the second act, this is what the stage looked like. While the cast was performing, a theater lamp short-circuited, broke, and threw a spark on a nearby drapery igniting it. The audience barely stirred, perhaps thinking it was a special effect. Stagehands attempted to put the fire out by patting at it with their hands, but they couldn't reach all of it. Another stagehand went to retrieve the equivalent of a fire extinguisher, but there was only one. There should have been several. No one was trained on using it properly, and when it was emptied, the fire remained. As the fire spread to more drapes and set pieces, actors on stage began to panic and wondered why the fire curtain, a large heavy curtain designed to stop the spread of fire into the audience, hadn't been lowered. What they didn't know was that the stagehand responsible for operating that curtain had been hospitalized that day, and the substitute didn't know which rope to pull. At this point, the main actor in the show, a man named Eddie, 
broke character and walked to the front of the stage to tell the audience to remain calm and stay in their seats. A stagehand eventually began to lower the fire curtain, but the curtain got stuck halfway down. They cut the ropes, hoping that the curtain would fall the rest of the way. It fell another foot and would never fall any lower. Eddie told the audience to calmly exit the theater, and witnesses described his heroism to remain on stage to calm the audience, while flaming chunks of scenery were falling to his right and his left. There were no exit signs. There should have been, but there weren't. To get out from the first floor, only one door was open, here. Everyone had to make their way to one side of the theater and go through that one door. There were many other doors, but they were locked, or they had handles like this that required special knowledge to work. These locks were new in the United States, so theater goers were not familiar with them. Only one usher knew how to work them, and that's only because he figured it out on his own. None of the ushers had been trained yet on the doors or on evacuation, and the theater hadn't yet run a fire drill. If you were on the second or third floors, no doors were open. People attempting to escape were met with ushers who refused to open the doors, as they were under instructions to let no one out during the performance, to prevent people from going down to the orchestra section to get a better seat. Six minutes after the lamp short-circuited and the fire began, a couple of actors opened this double door at the back of the stage. This introduced a large draft of outside air that the oxygen-hungry fire pulled in. Theaters typically have vents high above the stage, so that in the event of a fire, the vents can open and the air will be pulled away from the audience, up above the stage and out of the theater. The vents of the Iroquois were still nailed or wired shut. Construction workers neglected to remove them. As the fire pulled in air from the outside, multiple witnesses described a giant fireball that began at the edge of the stage, killed everyone still seated in the first few rows, and then turned into dense smoke and toxic fumes as it pushed up into the second and third floor balconies. On the second and third floors, people able to break the doors open on the north side made it to the fire escape to find them unfinished. This is the view of the theater from the stage, a day after the fire. Your best bet to escape from the orchestra section was out the only open door back on the right. The doors on the left side were locked, and they were all covered with curtains. On the second and third floors, no doors were open. They were confusing puzzles to open, locked, or fake. Many of the openings were arranged like this, a three-door set, with the leaves on the left hinged together in a bifold arrangement, and the right leaf a more normal door. The middle door has a foot bolt that effectively locks the leaves. Some doors in the theater also opened inward, so people rushing up against it blocked it from being opened. Most of the survivors were from the orchestra section. Fumes and flames made escape from the dress circle and the gallery very difficult. The fire lasted 17 minutes. 602 people died out of around 1,800. The next morning, the Indianapolis Star, Carl's hometown newspaper, reported this. 500 die in theater fire at Chicago. This is the front page of the Star from Thursday, December 31st. This was the performance Carl had planned to attend, but he didn't go. His attempts to get a train ticket back to Indianapolis were eventually successful, and he returned home that same Wednesday night. Carl very narrowly missed becoming a victim and leaving behind a wife and three-year-old daughter. In an article that Carl wrote many years later, he said, we felt something must be done. So he worked with his next door neighbor, an architect named Henry DuPont, and the owner of the hardware store, Mr. Vonnegut, and they came up with this, a self-releasing fire exit device. This is a page from a Vonnegut hardware catalog. 
it fixes three problems that the Iroquois theater doors had. First, no special knowledge is required to open them. Just push the bar. Second, if a group of people is pushed up against the door, they will fall against the bar, causing the door to simply open. Third, the door will swing outward, allowing free escape. And this self-releasing fire exit device will do all of this while still allowing the doors to be locked from the outside. There would be no need for a foot bolt or any other special lock. This product became not only demanded, but over time required by law as a means to provide life safety in commercial buildings. First sold briefly under the Vonnegut brand, the device eventually was marketed using a name derived from its three inventors, Vonnegut, DuPont, and Prinzler. And this became the name as we know it today, Von Duprin. Over the next 100 years, it would be steadily improved. And today, the flagship exit device is this, the 99 series exit device. It is regarded by many as the industry's best. They are very proudly built in Indianapolis, not too far from where the Vonnegut Hardware Company once stood, or from Carl and Nina Prinzler's house on 33rd Street. On January 1st, 1904, two days after the fire, the front page of Chicago's largest newspaper, the Tribune, looked like this. It's an editorial cartoon, doing what most editorial cartoons do, calling out for help. Carl's relatives described an immense survivor's guilt that he felt over the tragedy. He was said to plead with fire marshals to require that doors open outward. The story Carl presented was one of saving lives, not making money. He made references not only to the struggle to create the right product, but the fight to get the public to adopt it. An entire industry was created from these efforts. And this is what makes the Carl Prinzler story so sweet. One of the most crucial pillars of the Von Duprin organization and its parent company, a legion, is based on acts of aggressive humanitarianism, a passion to prevent tragedies, and a genuine focus on the naive building occupant, the theater goer, who, when panicked and forgetful, can strike the crossbar with their hand, or to quote Carl Prinzler himself, if they do not find the crossbar with their hand, the powers that be give them enough equilibrium to strike the crossbar with their body, and the trick is done. Since the first Von Duprin exit device was introduced in 1908, Carl's legacy has resulted in the installation of millions of exit devices to make exiting a building safe, automatic, and mindless. Von Duprin continues Carl's fight to protect building occupants through education, building code enhancement and enforcement, and product innovation. This invention has endured longer than any of our lives and will continue on long after our retirements. The part we play today is a chapter in a spectacular story of fighting to do the right thing in the service of others. I'm pretty sure that when he wrote this song, then he was raised.